Hello, my name is Katie O'Dare, and I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Student Life at Boston College. Welcome to Veritas at Beenham. Veritas at Beenham is a conversation series that features prominent faculty and administrators sharing their stories, how they began their careers in higher education, the people and events that had an impact on their professional development, and what it means to them personally to work at a Jesuit and Catholic university. Archived conversations can be viewed at the Church in the 21st Century Center website. Thank you, and enjoy the conversations. Well, I'm very glad to be here, and I want to thank Katie for the invitation and you for coming here this afternoon. Friday afternoon is not always a great time for attracting large crowds. and. Uh, I want to begin by making a comment about generations. Um, there is, I attended a lecture uh, last uh, June in Miami at the Catholic Theological Society of America by a professor James Davidson of Purdue who was a sociologist very interested in the Catholic Church and in studying uh, views of uh, theologians and uh, clergy. And one of the points that he made that I found surprising but on reflection convincing <clears throat> was that the greatest determinant of uh, cultural attitudes and of uh, theological points of view is the generation to which one belongs. It trumps gender, race, and class. And so what I'm going to be saying and talking about is my generation, which I don't, I can tell you is a long ways back. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not like the generation of most people here. <clears throat> but I think it might be uh, of interest to know how that comes. The reason being, obviously, that somebody of uh, uh, the generation is so important because there's a time between 13 and 14 and 25 or 26 when, even if we don't know it, uh, a lot of our attitudes are being formed, not only by our own conscious decision, but by the place and especially the time in which we live. <clears throat> when I grew up, and uh, I, even before, and my parents, uh, there, were the, uh, there were many things invisible in the United States, and one of them was, for me, growing up in Lewiston, Maine, uh, African Americans. Uh, Maine, even now, is the, is the state that has the least number of minorities, and that was even more true, I think, in the time that I grew up. Uh, so a lot of things hadn't happened. The Vietnam War hadn't happened. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement hadn't happened. So there was a great deal of cultural unity uh, that we thought was totally cultural unity. So I grew, I grew up then in a, in a time when people, young people like myself, made decisions early. My parent, I, I grew up in a family of eight children, seven boys and one girl, and uh, the girl, I think, can be said to have <laughs> suffered somewhat during her time. <laughs> Although with boy, the boys thought they were being very sensitive, but I don't, I don't think that was the opinion that she, shared, that she held. Uh, and I decided at a, I went to Holy Cross for one year. My father was a lawyer and my mother was a homemaker. My father knew just about everybody in town. It was a town of 42,000, a uh, mill town that had started to skid. And my mother knew, read about every book that she could lay her hands on. So I came from two parents who were quite different in their outlook. I went to Holy Cross for one year and then I decided at age 19 that I went into the Jesuits after thinking that I, after considering medicine, law, like my father, teaching, I thought that I could combine teaching and uh, being a priest, uh, and therefore I joined the Jesuits. I, uh, I thought that I knew what I was doing, and uh, my family, uh, my parents characteristically let me do anything I wanted, and they did it to all their children. And my friends in high school thought that it was wonderful that I knew what I was wanted to do so early. But the fact is that I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I found that fairly quickly after entering the Jesuit mission at Linux. What helped me finally find out what I really wanted to do were three things. One was the quality of the other novices that were in the Jesuits at the time. There were 30 of us. And maybe you, you might know uh, my classmates, uh, Edward O'Flaherty and Joseph Appleyard and Charlie Healy and John Higgins and so on. You can see the quality right there. Uh, another reason for my coming to some certainty was uh, the Jesuit tradition of spirituality that included the long retreat, uh, 
a novice director who was a very decent and good uh, person who helped me a lot, and uh, reading good books, especially the good book, the Bible. I found the, the good book, the Bible, played an enormous role in the course of my studies. And uh, one reason was because I knew it was a good book, but I couldn't understand it very well, especially the Old Testament. So I was therefore provoked to do study. And as I learned more about it, I began to appreciate some of it and understand some of it. I, uh, as I progressed in the Jesuits and took various uh, uh, philosophy and theology, I began to realize that I really wanted to specialize in the Bible. And so I was finally allowed to do so, and I got a doctorate uh, in the Bible at Harvard. It was my first exposure to that broader than Catholic world, although I, the, the, the town that I grew up in was, was far from being ghettoized. And then I went from uh, graduation at Harvard to about, uh, walked about uh, four or 500 yards uh, west to the place where I then taught for the next 38 years. You can see the, that that was a fairly limited world. But I taught at Weston for 38 years and uh, loved it. Taught the Old Testament, grew to uh, not only to understand it, but also to see its relevance for the New Testament and for, indeed, all of Christian theology. It awakened my uh, admiration for Judaism among other benefits that I, uh, I had. And then many of my... Uh, Good friends are Jews, and I always, always find Jewish scholarship very, very provocative and helpful to me. Uh, one of the things that I have found in uh, if, uh, the insight that I have got from the the new uh, the Old Testament was not to begin with Jesus, although I know that's somewhat unfashionable, and I don't mean it in the irreverent way it might be taken at first, but to begin with the beginning of the world and God's creation of a good world, but also God's plan. Uh, that is always at work, even and frequently despite uh, human resistance. And that governing of the world, I think you can call the kingdom of God, not so much a kingdom like the kingdom of France, but a reign or governing action that overcomes, uh, despite what people might think in, at any particular time, overcomes human resistance and malice. So that a kind of a divine presence that is active, a kind of energy, as the Greek theologians sometimes call it, <clears throat> is a very important part of my outlook on life, and it really helps me understand the work of Jesus, which is a kind of culmination of God's word, God's spirit, God's uh, touch, God's wisdom, that finally culminates in that uh, presence of Jesus and the continuation of that in the church, which continues in its own way, that governing the, uh, as well. So that's, that's been a very important part, and that's why I don't like people to begin with the New Testament alone. I, one of my things is, would you, if you were going, uh, would you ever decide, if you were beginning on a reading career of 10 or 12 years old, to begin every book that you read, biography, history, fiction, in, on chap in chapter 5? Would you always deliberately skip the first four chapters? Well, that's how it is if you don't read the New Test if you don't read the Old Testament before you read the New. So that's how, that's one of my ways of urging people to uh, immerse themselves as much as they can in the New Testament. <clears throat> so, uh, in the uh, in the latter part of my time at uh, Western Jesuit School of Theology, which was located near Harvard, and uh, we have some grads here, Mary and Sweeney, in the back. Uh, was the, an offer came in the in the October of uh, 2004 from Father Leahy that we should move our school over to Boston College and become a part of a new school called the School of Theology and Ministry. <clears throat> the um, it would have meant it meant a five mile commute, a five mile uh, move, I should say. Uh, there was a building that he had in mind for us to use and that uh, he also invited at the same time the Institute of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry to move at the same time. Not For them it was a move of a few hundred yards. For us it was a five mile move. Uh, <clears throat> they were seven faculty members. With a, they founded in 1973. A high, a very effective group of people. Uh, turned out a tremendous number of religious educators. A very high al uh, alumni loyalty rate and so on. And uh, we were a larger school of 200 students and uh, 17 faculty members. So it was, and then there was another component too, uh, and that is the uh, C21 online, which was a, uh, just beginning now, expanding uh, rapidly. 
a group of uh, a, a, a two people who are providing uh, online courses in theology, some of them uh, free, some of them short, some of them for uh, uh, a little bit longer and, and uh, meant to help people's uh, religious lives, spiritual and uh, theological reflection. <clears throat> you, you, may not have, you might, if you know a lot about group dynamics, have predicted what the faculties would do. You would think, would you not, that this opportunity, this golden opportunity, would immediately excite and stir people's uh, desires to get cracking and do it. But as you know, uh, to quote Mark Twain, uh, I'm all for progress. It's change I can't abide. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, both uh, groups, and I can't speak really at first hand for the Institute group, but both groups really had a good deal of hesitation about it. They had some real questions. They thought they would lose their own autonomy, their small town feel, their very personal way of doing things. And so there was a long discussion that took a while, a couple of years really, to work it through to the point where faculty members could say, I can see great possibilities in this, even though I might be hesitant and might be cautious and might be fearful of losing, losing some of the things I hold dear. Now, I was one of those people who never had any hesitation whatsoever. I could say that. I always, I thought it from the beginning it was a good move. I thought it would enhance our school. It would give us access to more students, that we could offer more resources to lay people. And uh, I didn't realize that my enthusiasm would eventually uh, mean that I would be offered the position of dean. <laughs> if I knew that, I think I wouldn't have been so enthusiastic. <laughs> I would have held my peace. But at that, uh, but since I was, uh, I saw the possibilities so quickly and immediately. And my friend uh, Bob Manning, who was president at the time, shared my enthusiasm. Uh, I, I was going to, without my being aware of it, uh, headed for the position of dean. Uh, Father Bob Manning, who was uh, equally instrumental and equally visionary with uh, Father Leahy, uh, was, in, was uh, instrumental in, in bringing us along. But unfortunately, uh, he contracted, uh, he had a, a disease called ankylosing spondylitis, which is a disease of the joints that pretty much wiped out his immune system so that when he was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, the cancer ripped right through him. He uh, bravely put up with it for a year and a half, but he died in October. So I uh, feel honored to continue his legacy. Uh, one of the points, now what do we, so I'll, I'll talk about myself now in the context of uh, the school a little bit, the new school. Uh, the, the new, just to give you a few facts, the new school now has a faculty of 26 people. We just hired a uh, young uh, new professor, Neto Valiente just recently, uh, and uh, we have uh, 150 full-time students, 150 part-time students. Uh, we occupy a building which is now our, temp which is our temporary home. Next year we're going to move to uh, uh, Lake Street, a new building in, on Lake Street which is uh, called St. Williams Hall, and that is being refurbished for us now. Uh, what is interesting is that we are going, we have an enormous surge in applications uh, Seventy percent over the applications that were uh, that were that were made to each one of the two educational institutions last year. So we anticipate we don't know what the yield will be of our acceptances, but we anticipate a dramatic increase in the number of students next year. So that's a good thing. It's a little frightening to know what to do with them, but we will certainly uh, welcome them with open arms. Um, what is, my, what, what is my philosophy on this uh, one element of it? And that is that uh, one of the points that I think is important is to maintain, to hold the center, and yet engage with real issues. If we are looked upon as either left wing or right wing or conservative or liberal, we lose a whole public. And as you know, American culture uh, American society is, is uh, a very uh, divided one in many respects between blue states, red states, liberal, conservative, which doesn't help people very much and it doesn't help civil, uh, civ uh, civil discourse. The church in its own way reflects that, uh, 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 that divide. And so if we want to be of service to the whole church and to the university, we have to keep to the center. That is to say, to be unashamedly Catholic, not in order to be sectarian, but in order to have an identity that enables you to talk to other people on the level of faith. If one is simply looking around 
and uh, rec registering everything that comes along with respect, there's no dialogue possible. But if one has a conviction that is matched with an openness of heart, then conversation is possible at a deep level, and that's what we're trying to do. At the same time, it's important to engage uh, with the issues of the day. And in my talk in October 21st, I named four of them, and all of them are hot-button issues uh, of some kind or other, or things that at least worry people. And I'll name them right now, but they're not the only issues we want to deal with, but they are some. And one is the, the, uh, the uh, education and the formation of priests, of, of, of uh, lay ecclesial ministers, and others who want to have a faith-based approach to life in such a way that they connect with each other, they really listen to each other, so that when priests and lay people go out to do ministry in the church, they are friends, they have the same education, they know how to listen to each other and how to cooperate, how to disagree, but how to agree as well. So that's a very important point. We want to offer formation, human formation, uh, that enables people to connect, uh, to, be, to live healthy and, and uh, lives, but also lives of commitment. Another thing we want to do is to help lay people find their way in the church, and especially women, who in the Catholic Church many times feel excluded and not valued, but they have their gifts to offer, their contributions to make, and this is one of the things that we want to see if we can further, because the richness of the uh, women, uh, of women in the Catholic Church, could, the contribution could be tremendous, could be really helpful and wonderful. Another point is the Hispanic ministry. A huge number, the Catholic Church now is about 40% uh, Hispanic, and it's only going to increase. And we want to find, help Hispanic people uh, integrate themselves in the broader church and also to keep their own traditions but uh, contribute to the health and vitality of the Catholic population. Finally, handing on the faith. I don't think there's a parent in the world, or at least in North America, who is it, of any religion, and of perhaps no religion, who is not worried about their children. And we want, how about whether their children will accept and, uh, and receive the legacy, the religious legacy that their parents have found so rich. So that's one of the points that we want to uh, help people do that, and that's one of the great virtues of having the Institute of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry right in the middle of the school, because they have the skills Tom Groom, a uh, world-renowned professor of uh, religious education, is there eager to share his wisdom and learning and great experience. So that's something that we are going to, uh, to work with. We have two relations. Uh, people are defined in some ways by their relationships. Uh, our two basic relationships, I think, are to the church, both local and, to, and, and global, and also to the university. We have a great relationship with uh, Cardinal Sean O'Malley. We are eager to also connect to the uh, St. John's Seminary, with which we have a good relationship. And uh, we have huge, no we are a very international group. 25% of our student body is international, whereas in the rest of the graduate schools, it's about 10 to 12%. Then we have 25, more than 25% of our faculty is international. Iraq, Bag uh, uh, Egypt, Colombia, El Salvador, uh, Ireland, etc. So we have a, a very broadly uh, representative faculty, and that's a big advantage that we are proud of because uh, it facilitates conversation. So those are some of the uh, things that uh, give me life and get me up in the morning uh, most days, <laughs> except Saturday, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know if you have any uh, reflections you'd like to share. I'm not, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how long I've gone, to tell you the truth, but uh, those are some of the points that I've made.